So hello, my friends. Um, thank you. Thank you to so many of you who are here. It's really uplifting to be able to be with you and um, have my team and I listen and report back to you um, and then take your questions. So I'm Joe Comerford. I have the unbelievable honor of representing the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District in the Massachusetts State Senate. And that's 24 of the most beautiful cities and towns in the entire Commonwealth, um, right here in Western Massachusetts. Tonight's town hall is one part report back from me, followed by questions from you. Um, we're using a Zoom webinar format tonight, so I can't see your faces, but it's gonna make it easier for us to share information. Um, and it's just very heartening to know that uh, you know close to 400 people signed up for this evening. And it's also thanks to the great uh, open media channels that we have here in the region, it's going to be recorded and then broadcast. So there are instructions on how to access the English subtitles in the chat. Um, and there's, it's a, the chat is at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little speech bubble. So if you haven't paid attention to the chat, please do. Um, there's information there in English and in Spanish. Um, and that's gonna be really important. And I'm, I'm really very, very grateful to Alison castillo Roseblatt and Carla Rivera, who are here with us this evening from Just Words Co-op. Thanks to both Alison and Carla, we have simultaneous Spanish language tra transportation, uh, transportation, goodness gracious, interpretation this evening at tonight's event. And I'm, I'm very excited about that. So all participants in tonight's Zoom town hall must select a language preference, either English or Spanish. And so the only thing you have to do is uh, just select interpretation at the bottom of your screen. It looks like a little globe. Um, and then you choose English or Spanish. And if you're having any problems at all, just use that little speech bubble, the chat, um, and ask for help. And someone will absolutely um, help you. Uh, so with that, I am going to share my um, my own slides that I prepared and uh, start this report back to you. All right. Um, so friends, again, uh, my name is Joe. I am deeply honored to be here in this virtual or remote town hall meeting with you. I ache to be together in person and we will be together again soon, but I'm really glad uh, we're using technology so that I can be accountable to you, um, tell you what we've been up to and answer your questions. This is my second term representing the Hampshire Franklin Worcester District in the Massachusetts State Senate. And this picture here is the new outline of the district that's as a result of redistricting. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as the evening goes on. But that light blue within the big um, state of Massachusetts is our beautiful district. So this is the fifth report back uh, since I took office, the third we've done remotely. Last year's town hall um, was uh, sort of a wind up for what the session, this current session that we're in, was going to look like. And we kicked off the session by telling you the bills we filed and the committees I was on. Um, and we promised to come back this year, just about a year ago, a year from when we talked to you last, and tell you what we did um, and tell you the impact you helped us have um, and what we had planned for the rest of the session. Before I get going, I just wanna say a couple of really important things. Um, we have a ton of information in these slides and I'm gonna make sure that each of you get copies of these slides so that we can move through them quickly enough, um, but you can also study them later. And of course you can call me or text me or email me um, with questions. The second thing is um, that I have wonderful colleagues in the House and the Senate, wonderful. Um, and so as I talk to you about the work my team and I are doing, um, I want you to know that I do that in league with great human beings who serve in the House and the Senate. And I also do it in league with you. This district, this beautiful, geographically beautiful district is full of unbelievable people. And your advocacy is leading the Commonwealth. You make me personally stronger. Uh, you make my team stronger. You make us fight harder for this district. 
but you also make the Commonwealth smarter. Uh, and so I just want you to know that tonight's report back, I hope you see yourselves in that report back because it belongs to you. All right, I'm gonna get us situated as we start. So as you know, the legislature in Massachusetts were elected for a two year term. So this is the 2021, 2022 term. Uh, and I'm just gonna talk now about the legislation that we file. So we start every term, and again, that started last year in 2021, we start by filing legislation. And that legislation gets filed in January of the first year, it moves on to co-sponsorship, it goes to a hearing, the committee makes a decision, and then it moves through some other committees, which are called destination committees, like ways and means or rules or healthcare financing before it comes to the floor in the chamber. Now it has to pass both chambers uh, before it gets reconciled and goes to the governor. Now this little neat bar looks neat, and but we know it doesn't always happen like that. It's very rarely a linear look, but when it is linear, it looks like this. And the budget looks like this. Um, so where we have two years to file legislation, we only have one year to do a budget. So we do two budgets in our session, right? Our sessions are two years long. We do two budgets. And the um, little uh, red star is where we are in the budget process. So we're nearing the end. And that budget process starts with uh, the governor considering and the governor's agency considering what they want to spend money on. The legislature looks at how much money we're gonna have. The governor files a budget, the house files and debates a budget. And then it comes to us in the Senate and we file a budget based on our priorities. We put amendments in and then, and which is what we're in the middle of doing right now this week. So your timing is perfect. Um, and then the week before Memorial Day, uh, we debate and vote um, for those amendments. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into this webinar. So this is the work of our team currently. Um, and it, it can't all be captured on one slide, but we break it down like this. I get appointed to committees every year, this uh, every session rather. And this session, I'm appointed as chair of public health in the Senate and chair of a new committee called the COVID-19 and Emergency Preparedness and Management. It's a lot of words, but really what it means is my job in the Senate is to make sure we learn the lessons of this brutal pandemic and emerge from the pandemic stronger, smarter, more equitable. Um, and that's along everything you can think of from first responders to how we can best serve our public health in our cities and towns. And then I also sit on a number of other committees like uh, being vice chair of the Joint Committee on Higher Education um, and being on the Joint Committee on Racial Equity, Civil Rights and Inclusion. Those are my, that's my job job, if you will, are my committees. I also chair um, and work on councils and task forces and commissions. For example, I serve on the statewide food policy council and I'm the Senate chair of something called the Racial Inequities and Maternal Health Commission. Um, and then on the right side of your screen, I also join a lot of caucuses and caucuses are where we self-organize as legislators. We get to say, hey, I'm interested in clean energy. I'm interested in criminal justice reform. So I'm gonna get with colleagues and we're gonna think about those things and we're gonna propose legislation and we're gonna fight for budget spending. So those are caucuses and those are the ones I've chosen to do. Um, and you help me choose those, right? By telling me what you think is important. Okay, um, as you saw in our little logo, our district is changing. Um, so because of redistricting, and I'm sorry about this, um, we've lost the beautiful communities of Colerain, Waitley, and South Hadley in the next session. So I am running for office, uh, but I'm running for office in a newly shaped um, Hampshire Franklin Worcester district. So we've lost, we will in the next session lose three communities. I still work for you. Coleraine, Waitley, and South Hadley, and I'm going to pick up Petersham, Athol, Winchenden, and Ashburnham. Um, and I'm proud that the Senate fought, the senators in the Western Mass um, region fought to keep our Senate seat, um, so we didn't lose a seat um, through redistricting. It just meant in order to get the population, which is going to go up to about 170,000 people per senator, we had to push north and east. Um, 
the beautiful thing is that in addition to the Connecticut River that I get to steward this portion of and my team and I get to fight for, we now are really uh, pretty squarely wrapped around the beautiful Quabbin um, and that watershed. So while our district is changing, our work is growing. Um, this really intense um, graphic uh, represents the following. Um, it represents about 121,000 constituent contacts. I'm gonna say that again, 121,000 times. We've answered a phone call, a letter, um, we've had a visit, we've answered an email. And that's a remarkable, remarkable testament to you. Um, that, is, that is all that you bring to the office to tell us how, where to fight, what to look for, what to do. Um, that tells us what you like and what you don't like about what we're doing. Um, so that's a map. It's, it's hard to tell the magnitude of it, but that's what it represents. It also represents something that I'm deeply proud of, and that's our commitment to constituent work. And since the beginning of taking office, we have closed successfully 1,678 cases. And we're gonna talk about what constituent cases are in just a bit, um, but that's what this uh, map represents. All right, so let me talk about the work. Who's doing all of this work? Um, so tonight with us is Elena Cohen, who's district director, Rachel Klein, constituent services director, um, and she's the newest to our team. Welcome, Rachel. Cameron Lease, Communication and Engagement Director, Brian Rossman, Legislative Director, and Jared Friedman, um, Chief of Staff. Um, it's lovely that they're all here um, with us this evening. Um, Jared and Elena are also from the district. They were raised here. So I love that we have deep roots on the team. I also wanna shout out to Sam Hopper, who's not gonna like that I'm doing this, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, Sam was on the team before she left to this great opportunity, but Sam's here with us running tonight's webinar. Um, so we get to benefit from Sam's generosity and brilliance um, and also maintain a great connection and, and Sam's big brain trust on behalf of the district. So thank you, Sam. All right, I'm gonna talk about our work now in three buckets. So um, these are the buckets that I'm going to talk about them in. First, I'm going to talk about municipal, regional, business, and constituent service. And then I'm going to go up down to the other two. So we, this is how we think about our job. And we do our job for you, right? We work for you, uh, no one else, the constituents on this um, webinar tonight. So when we think about this first bucket, this municipal, regional, business, constituent services, we, we do this work by interfacing with state and regional agencies on regulations, concerns, and questions. We do this with money, um, both current grants that are available, current spending in bond and budgets um, and emerging opportunities. And then we do this through issue-based work and that's infrastructure, climate mitigation, schools, so much more. Um, and so I want to tell a couple of stories because I think the stories help uh, bring all of this to light, right? Um, so let me talk about first a story about municipalities. Um, you may remember a couple of Julys ago, there was a terrible storm, a terrible storm, lots of rain, wind. There was a great deal of damage done, especially in the Northern part of our district. Um, MEMA came in, that's the Massachusetts Emergency Management, and they worked with our colleagues at FEMA, those are the federal folks, and they, they worked with our municipalities, which boy, that was not an easy job for our municipal officials, um, and they calculated the cost, and we had enormous cost here in our district, but it didn't, it wasn't shared necessarily equally across the Commonwealth, and we didn't get federal funding, and that was a terrible blow, um, but our Communities still had to recover. They had to rebuild the roads. They had to rebuild buildings. Um, it was, and they had to reroute water and so much more. So I joined with great Adam Hines, um, our colleague to the West um, in the Senate. And I worked with Natalie Blay in the House and we were able to get $7.5 million um, in the ARPA budget, just for emergency relief, direct cash payments to communities. Um, and about 3.2 million of that 7.5 came to about 14 communities in our district to help relieve um, this work. It wasn't the whole amount of money they need and deserve, but it was something meaningful from the state. Similarly, in a municipality in the northern part of the district, um, 
in an industrial park where lots of really important businesses are, they found out that the water pressure in that industrial park wasn't able to support real fire suppression as it should. And there was a real worry on the part of the town that this would mean that businesses couldn't be there and that's tax base and that's jobs for the people and that's whole economic ripple. Um, and we worked together uh, with great Rep Whips, um, Susanna Whips up in the North Quabbin. We, talked with Secretary Mike Keneally from the economic, um, it's the Executive Office of Economic Development, EOHED, lots of acronyms in the state, and his team, and we were able to get the, them tuned in to this community that needed a quick infusion. And sure enough, this community was able to get a $1 million grant to build a water tower, which will not only help the businesses there, but will help make this really important industrial park able to you know, be home to more and more businesses in this region that needs the taxes and needs the jobs. Um, another moment that our team remembered was when uh, a water main burst, a water pipe burst in Hadley, outside of what's called Vesta Homes. The great municipal officials in Hadley, the Council on Aging, um, they all went to work. And so with Dan Carey, you know, we wondered, our team wondered what we could do. So we reached out to the uh, property manager of Vesta Homes, a guy named Greg Conover, because we were hearing from constituents a great deal of concern. Um, and we uh, invested some time with Mr. Conover. We invited him to talk directly to constituents and the town. We held a meeting where he answered question after question after question. And then we supported Mr. Conover and and the town as they were able to, you know, um, rebuild after the water main break, get people back in their homes and really be held accountable uh, for supporting them through that transition. And that work is actually ongoing. Um, here's another story. Uh, this came from Elena. Um, there's a great farm in South Deerfield, an unbelievable farm. And this farm takes something called Healthy Incentives Project money. Healthy Incentives Project is this wonderful program where people who are using food stamps or are SNAP, depending on how you say it, um, they get their dollars doubled by the state. Um, and we're fighting for that money in the budget right now. And this farm had a technical split with a farm store. They were still the same place, but for reasons that the business needed, the farm store um, is now a different thing from the farm. And all of a sudden, the farm couldn't take HIP anymore. And HIP is not only morally, ethically, um, socially the right thing to do, but it's also a significant portion of this farmer's sales. And we were able to work um, with the DTA, the Department of Transitional Assistance, to help them see that it was actually the same place uh, and to not take away the ability of this farm to accept HIP. And that's a win for the people who get nutritious food and it's a win for the farmer. Um, so, and that same farmer got something called a food, in, um, food security infrastructure grant and the state was expecting uh, that farmer to do work in, in record time during growing season and it just wasn't going to work. So we were, able to work for that farmer and so many other farmers in the region who got access to this pretty significant money and push that date out so that they could enter growing season, not worrying about construction. They could focus on growing and food and the food system and that money will be for, there for them when they need it. Um, and we did that working with the energy environment crew and the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture Resources. And it did that work in partnership with Rep Natalie Blay and of course, with the great advocacy of CISA, Phil Corman and CISA. Um, and then there's just numbers of individual stories, constituents that needed access to the COVID vaccine, uh, constituents having to deal with railroad, um, uh, the railroad behavior, either idling trains or um, very toxic smelling ties outside their house, constituents needing to deal with unemployment insurance um, or just regular health insurance. That's the kind of work that our team does on behalf of um, our communities. So I'm going to go on. Um, I, well, I'm just going to go back. Okay, yes. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to talk now about the grants that we um, give access to. So these are grants for um, that can go to individual programs like nonprofits. They can also go to municipalities. And these grants um, need to be fully understood, cracked open, and then advocated for. Every week we're advocating for um, a municipality or many municipalities, nonprofits. And so what we did is we put together a, 
uh, series. It's a beautiful series. We're doing it with the regional planning agencies. Elena from our team is leading, along with great folks like Natalie Blay, all the senators. Um, and we are bringing these folks um, who run these in really important grants, we're bringing them to meet with our constituents virtually, um, and then giving our constituents an ability to ask questions about these really critical funding pots. All right, I'm gonna move on now. So that's part of the work that we've been doing. Now I'm gonna go to the second part of the work that we've been doing, which we call legislation and engagement. Um, and we think about this as our committee bills and initiatives. And remember I have two committees and there's about 400 bills that I'm responsible for as chair and my team's responsible for. Our office's bills, and that's about 70 of them. And then the floor bills, the bills that are coming to the floor in the legislature. So let me give you some, some details here. And here are some of the details. So we've had a lot of legislation come before the Senate. And that's really important because coming back out of uh, you know, emerging um, from the COVID pandemic, there have been a lot of really critical issues um, that weren't able to be tackled um, in the uh, last years, right? 20 and 21, the beginning of 21. So there was a lot of pent up need, a lot of pent up enthusiasm and urgency, frankly, um, on our part. Um, so the Senate this session, and this is not a full list, this is just highlights. Um, we passed ARPA, right? We spent the federal money um, we're going to talk about what that looked like for our district. We passed something called the Votes Act, which is expanding access um, to the ballot. It's something I care deeply about. Things like same day voter registration, uh, vote by mail, um, early voting. And we worked with our town clerks, who are the most intrepid humans, to try to figure out how to right size that work. Um, we did a mental health bill, which was pretty vast and looked at all kinds of mental health needs and the desert that we have here in Western Massachusetts. And we looked at something called, for example, ED boarding or emergency department boarding. Um, we passed something called the PACT Act, which is pre prescription drug control. We passed another supplemental budget where we helped really get some reforms around the uh, COVID pandemic and as well as some money. We did redistricting, which is something that changed our own Senate district. Um, we did a bill regulating veterans' homes. And I have that highlighted because I wanted to tell you a particular story, which is um, that the tragedy that befell the Holyoke Soldiers' Home touched a number of our neighbors, as many of us know. Um, and I had been working with my Senate colleagues to think, what could I contribute here um, that would help make sure that never happened again? And here I want to raise up veteran services officer Steve Connor and uh, veteran advocate John Parody. They are beautiful and they have made me so much smarter. And so working with Senator John Velas, who led on this, I put in an amendment um, and it wasn't an easy one to do. And I want to shout out to Jared and Brian who helped, but we, we actually realigned that bill. And so now forever in our veterans homes, the Department of Public Health on, in the Senate bill, um, will have to license and regulate the veterans' homes. So the people who care about health in the state will be the bottom line responsible people. And that was important. Um, we passed the Crown Act, a beautiful bill about natural hair and, and natural hairstyles and making sure there's non-discrimination. We passed two climate bills. Um, and here, because of you, we really threw down. Um, so in the first climate bill at the beginning of the session um, was a bill that, uh, that the, I call it the Amherst bill. It was a bill um, to uh, ensure that we had a net zero building code inserted into what's called stretch codes. Um, this is super duper wonky stuff. That means we have to build, if, if you're a green community and you use a stretch code, um, soon, hopefully soon, um, you will be building using net zero. And there are people in Northampton and Amherst who have made me so smart about this. And I'm deeply humbled because it is quite complicated to get this right. And I'm gonna stay in it um, on behalf of the state. We also, uh, and on behalf of the district, we also had in this current, it's called the DRIVE Act. We had um, a bill that was very important to a number of um, 
solar developers, small solar developers here, and also some really terrific builders. And it allowed for uh, greater access to what's called net metering benefits. It's called the single parcel rule that was inserted in this drive act, which was the most recent climate bill. And then we really did very well, I, I have to say on, on amendments. Um, here again, it was a team effort, you on the team telling us what had to happen. Um, so we um, we did a healthy and school green schools bill. We got that inserted. Um, we got something for green communities inserted. We got inserted a preference for solar that would allow for pollinators. Um, and then we uh, actually got to carry the amendment that I call the Smarter Smart Program, um, which is really looking at the next generation of solar incentives. And it actually talks about the right balance between carbon sequestration and solar panels. It talks about helping municipalities um, uh, be able to navigate what is a very, very complex situation. Um, so that smarter, smart amendment is was also passed. And so those are all in the Senate bills. And then in the House climate bill, um, we also um, had a bill, thanks to the partnership that we have with Natalie Blay, um, with Rep Blay, we have a grid modernization bill because none of this is possible, not wind, not solar, uh, unless we really update our grid. Right now, our grid is pretty old and it's one directional and we need a grid that's dynamic, that stores and sends from multiple directions. And that's what our grid modernization bill would do. And that's in the House. And so now these are meeting in what's called a conference committee. Uh, and we're going to work with you to make sure our district's priorities make it through. Um, we also did something called sports wagering or sports betting. Um, and then <laughs> this is the penultimate. Um, thanks to so many of you, we were able to pass in the Senate. Thank you, universe, the Work and Family Mobility Act. Um, and I will say it was a beautiful moment uh, in the Senate uh, to hear the roar of the people in the galleries and the roar on the street. Um, this is, of course, an immigrant rights bill, but it's also it's also a public health bill. It's an economic development bill. It's a pro-education bill. Um, it's a public safety bill. It works every way you can slice it. And we have a veto proof majority in the Senate. Uh, the House has a veto proof majority, so the governor can choose to not sign this and let that be on him. We will override him and we will pass this into law like many states have. Um, so that's just a little bit of a blurb of what we've done in the Senate. There's more to do. Um, and then pending um, here, I just wanna call your attention uh, to this thing called SAFE 2.0, S-A-P-H-E, the State Action for Local Public Health Excellence. Um, that's a bill that we've passed once in the Senate. We're, we're going for the house. I, I think it's gonna happen. We've also passed something called Gender X, which would ensure non-binary markers on every birth certificate, every license and every state document because gender shouldn't fit into an M or an F box. And we know that. And with the attacks on trans folks across the country, we gotta do this now. Um, the Senate's passed it twice. We've gotta get it through. Rep Dom is the house um, advocate here and she is amazing. Um, we have a farm and food equity bill where we're working on, our team is working on, and then I'm hoping for child care and child welfare legislation, reproductive expansions, reproductive equity, and other trans safeguards, and of course, the end of life options, and I'm happy to answer more questions about any of these. So in addition to the legislation, um, you know, we, our committee work, as I said, has to pull out the bills that are before us in public health and the COVID committee. Um, but we also have to do oversight. So this year um, I co-chaired the Racial Maternal Equ Health Equity Commission, as I mentioned, uh, out of the Public Health Committee. We also did many oversight hearings for the Emergency Preparedness Committee, the COVID Committee. Um, and we did uh, a number of joint public health and COVID hearings on our COVID response in the state and things like pediatric vaccinations. And then none of this would be meaningful if we didn't engage with you. Now you can tell us how to do this better and I hope you do. Um, we maintain websites, social media, um, and that's uh, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I have to confess, I am not on Instagram, but Cameron is, thank goodness. Um, maybe someday I will, maybe I'll get to TikTok. I don't know, my kids would probably 
lose their <laughs> lose their cool if I did. Um, we do email newsletters, issue email blasts. Um, we attend a lot of district events and we love your invitations. So please keep them coming. And then we we events, we organize events uh, by our team. Um, and that's mostly Elena and Cameron uh, and Sam when she was with us. And we pull our colleagues from the west, uh, from the east to the west. And that's super important because we have something unique out here. We have unique ideas, we have unique needs, we have unique assets. And being here with our people um, helps people understand the richness of this area and opens their hearts and minds. For example, we did a big farm tour. Um, thanks to CISA, thanks to great partnership with lots of House members and senators, and we're gonna be able to hopefully bring a bill to the Senate floor on agriculture equity. And that's because hearts and minds were engaged in Senate leadership. So we have to keep doing that work. That is essential work. Um, it's also, you know, all of these are really essential. UMass Extension, um, we brought our team to UMass Extension to really understand the depth of their work. And now we're fighting for an amendment in the Senate budget because we're so excited about the kind of game-changing critical work that's happening at UMass. Um, we also do town halls like these. We hold office hours, thanks to Elena. Um, and we're picking up the library tour. Lots of you have asked, you know, hey, you started this library tour before COVID, but you're ever gonna finish it. Well, the answer is yes, we're gonna finish it. Um, we have 15 remaining stops. That includes the four new towns. We're gonna do them from June 8th to September 24th. I hope you come out, we'll be in person. Maybe we'll be on a lawn to be safe, but we're gonna be at those libraries. The first batch was so beautiful. And if you were on early, you heard, uh, oh, you saw some of the pictures from the first batch. So we're absolutely going back. Okay, uh, and we're coming to the end, friends. Um, so I wanna talk about our, our work um, in around budget and bond bills now. And that's local earmarks, right? That's money I bring home. And that's statewide priorities. And those statewide priorities are because you tell me they're important. Uh, and because I look around and I think they're important and my team thinks they're important. Um, so we got to get to the numbers um, because the numbers don't lie, right? Now, I'm going to show you a lot of numbers now. I don't, I, 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 I hope they're not overwhelming. Again, I'm sending out these slides, but I, for transparency and accountability sake, I, I thought it was really critical. Um, so uh, in the last budget, that's a year ago, so after I spoke with you last, we had the fiscal year 22 budget, that's what we're in now. Um, we had a bunch of statewide programs that we fought for, like local public health, um, and like violence prevention, and uh, youth gun violence, and so, so much more. Um, but we also fought for our children's advocacy centers to bring this money home, uh, for pediatric sexual assault nurse examiners. Um, in this region, we didn't have them. We wanted a safe havens program. That's a wonderful supportive housing program. We didn't have one here, thanks to Pamela Schwartz and the Western Net Mass Network to End Homelessness. We figured out how to do it. Um, we connected with DMH and we, and we got one and now we have to keep it. Um, we brought grants for local public health, thanks to Phoebe Walker up in Franklin County, who has made us infinitely smarter. Um, and then we did a bunch of other things. I'll just give you a moment to read uh, what we did before I flip the slide. Okay, um, I'll send you these, so don't worry. Um, and then we had to deal with ARPA, right? We did ARPA-1 um, and ARPA-1 is hopefully followed very soon by ARPA-2. I'm happy to answer your questions about that. That's federal money that came into Massachusetts. So we had some federal money and then we, um, we squished in some surplus, right? Because our economy is robust and we were able to uh, do this first tranche of ARPA. And so I, I talked to you already about, I told you the story of the 7.5 million for the storm damage. We also were able to bring money home for UMass, this water and energy testing center. It's one of the best places on UMass campus. I'll take you on a tour of it. They are the only place in the Eastern Seaboard looking and studying and mitigating and teaching people about PFAS. PFAS is a class of 9,000 people-made chemicals. They are in our water all around us and we need UMass Amherst to be strong. Um, so I am. That's, that's not all the money they need and I'm back at it in this budget. Um, 
We uh, were able to pass some healthy soil legislation in our first session, but we had to fund it in this session. So we did that. Um, and then we put a lot of money into affordable housing, 370,000 for rural development, 221,000 for Franklin County um, regional housing and redevelopment, um, a uh, 128,000 for a series of a set of units in Northampton um, for folks who are unhoused. Um, the town of Bernardston needed infrastructure money, the Mosquito Control District, which we'll talk about, um, and then other uh, critical needs that were again brought to us by people like you. And now we're tackling the fiscal year 23 budget. Again, just came out on Tuesday, we're digesting it now. Um, it's 49.86 billion. Um, and we're looking at stuff we have to get for the state, stuff that we think is important and advocates are asking us for, local and regional earmarks and what are called outside sections, outside sections or policy sections. Um, and okay, this is number alert now, but we'll get through it. Um, so I've highlighted some things I'll talk about as we look at these slides. Um, we continue to invest in local public health. We're going to get that bill passed. But right now, I can tell you that just with the uh, money we've gotten, and that's $200 million that I was able to help secure in the ARPA funds and the big public health investments throughout the COVID pandemic, about 91% of local city and town public health are on track to be regionalized, that's sharing services, that's building capacity. So we're going to be able to have greater and greater increases in health standards for our people and equity. Um, so what is what we need when the next time we face the next disaster or the next pandemic. Um, we are investing mightily in reproductive health supports. Um, and here I, I am with you um, in the Supreme Court decision. Um, and I think we can do more than money. We have to do more than money to enshrine reproductive health in the Commonwealth. We passed the Roe Act here. Um, in the Commonwealth, we have to do more to support people in other states. Um, and I'm glad for these initial investments. I was part of the advocacy, but again, I think we can do more. Uh, and then we are gonna continue. Um, this is the last bottom line, this low threshold housing. This was a program also um, really flagged by Pamela. It's a program now emerging in our region. Um, we helped support this last session. We're going in at this session. It's really for people, again, with complex situations um, and they just need some supportive housing. Um, that's a justice that people should be having access to. And I'm excited about that, um, especially as we work as a region um, to tackle the affordable, affordable housing gap, um, which is part of what we are tackling with those ARPA um, investments. And then we also get to folks who are without homes or houseless. Um, we're looking at a lot of economic development supports. I want to say that I am with you with regional transit. We can do better on this. I just want to say that. Um, and some of the big investments in the Mass Department of Transportation will help us access the federal money coming in, and that's including federal money for rail, which I'm happy to answer questions about. K-12 education and higher education, huge, huge for us um, in this region. We're, we're going some of the distance, not all of it. The house did some good work, especially on transportation. We catch some other good stuff here and we have to meet in conference, which is often how these bills get reconciled. I am happy to tell you that one of my major priorities was higher education and we did well in the Senate in higher education. Um, and I wanna thank the MTA educators and staff um, and all of you know GCC, UMass, all of the advocacy helps us go in and fight harder. Here again is the housing stabilization money um, in different views um, where, again, where we did okay on some things we didn't do as good as the house and others. Um, and we'll try to get those numbers up where we can. And then we'll, that the budget fight doesn't end in the Senate. It goes all the way through conference. And finally, uh, so, social safety net supports. I, I really am quite proud of the Senate uh, for um, the ways in which we, we really look at that safety net. Here, I wanna call attention to uh, nursing home investments where we've been 
really good on leading and um, and actually rest homes. We have numbers of rest homes in the district. I was just at the Lathrop Rest Home in Northampton. Um, these are critical, critical um, players in this arc as we get older and we need care. Um, and financially, it was just not going to work unless we were able to come and help out. Okay, um, this is nearly the end of the slides. Um, in addition to this work, we work regionally, right? Um, and because we have great colleagues and we have this big, vast district, um, it doesn't work, doesn't just, um, it's not useful for us only to work in Hampshire County or Franklin County. We have to work across counties. And so we do that with a lot with the pandemic, everything from unemployment to sick time for workers, which is where we threw down to access to testing and vaccines, wastewater testing, which I'm really into right now, um, essential worker supports, making it possible for outdoor dining and alcohol provisions. Um, I didn't have this in here, but um, municipal um, uh, meeting provisions, all of this is really important. Of course, affordable housing, and we do that with um, in partnership with a terrific network, and that includes the Western Mass Network to End Homelessness, but also Wayfinders and others, um, pre-K to higher ed, um, you know who you are. Um, we are we are constantly locking arms here, and that's everything from the the work we need um, uh, around the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to school buildings. Um, we are working at hard on the relicensing of First Light Hydro. Happy to talk about that. We're working hard on regional rail um, and the RTAs and some transit pilots. Um, so to look at micro transits. Um, we care about workforce development and are in their infrastructure and climate initiatives. Um, communities like Deerfield, for example, make us super smart about that. We are uh, with arts and culture. Um, we've been able to bring out Michael Bobbitt, who's this great ED of the Mass Cultural Council, for example. Um, and he's toured the district like his predecessor did. And we've done that in partnership with reps like Rep Sabadosa and Rep Dom and Rep Blay and Rep Carey. Um, and now we're gonna bring Michael out again um, and mosquito control. Um, if you wanna talk about bugs, I'll talk about bugs any day with you, but this has been a huge piece of work. We ended up getting the bill in public health. Um, we wrote the bill. Um, Brian Rossman from our team has been on the mosquito task force and we're gonna see it through for our team, uh, for our municipalities. Um, and finally, here's how to reach us. There's just three of us here. You can reach any of us um, by Googling us or getting online. We'll make sure you have all of this information. And thank you um, for allowing me to share um, this overview. Um, and now um, I want to get as quickly as we can uh, to your questions. I'm gonna look here um, and I'm gonna go very, very quickly from Kevin. Um, how is Senate bill S89 coming. S89, for folks who don't know, is the end of life options. It's a bill that I've been proud um, to file this session. We've passed it twice out of um, the Senate Public, uh, the Joint Committee on Public Health. Um, we just had a um, we just had a briefing on it uh, yesterday, and we're pushing for it. It's in healthcare financing. It's got to come to the floor. It's got to be passed. Um, from Jeff. Um, is, it, is there a chance that your grid mod bill and green bank oh, bill, so grid mod is different than green bank. Green bank, I believe you're talking about Paul Marks bill, Rep Marks bill. Um, is it, so I'll just talk about the grid mod, which is the bill I have with Rep Blay. Yes, there's a huge chance that the grid mod bill is going into the final climate bill. It's in the house bill, like um, the single parcel was in uh, the Senate bill. So we sort of tag team Rep Blay and I, um, so I'm hope I'm hoping um, that we are able to um, see that in conference and fight for it. In fact, Jared has fired off um, advocacy. We're talking advocates. I just talked to them today. We're pushing into the climate uh, conference committee. You have to push into the climate conference committee and help us. So, and many of you are. And here, climate action now and mothers out front. I mean, are my heroes. Um, so thank you. You made me so much smarter uh, than ever. Uh, in this last climate debate. What's my stand on safe consumption sites? I'm public in support of safe consumption sites. There was just a good article in the Gazette about that. Um, and I, uh, I believe in safe consumption sites like I believe in needle exchanges, like I believe in fentanyl testing strips. They meet people where they are. They're harm reduction methodologies and they work. Research proves 
they work. Um, so uh, there's another one from Norman. I'm wondering how likely it is for your bill um, S749, and oh, this is with Great Rep Barber, um, that's H1246, um, an act protecting the homes and senior, uh, the homes of seniors and disabled people on mass health. Um, Norman is wondering if it's finally going to get passed and how it might take, how it, how long it might take. Um, so, uh, Nor Norman, I just want to say um, I am very deeply grateful for your advocacy. This bill came out of a constituent case. So many people don't know this, friends. Um, but if you are over 55, if you are receiving services because of mass health, in Massachusetts, our laws up until recently were more draconian than many other states. We, what's called clawing back or reclaimed, recovering the states, all these words, the estates of the people who are deceased while they receive or after they've received mass health services. That is horrific to me. We do way more than the federal government says we have to do. And so Rep Barber is this great rep. We have a bill. Now I'll tell you, this is a story, Norman and everybody, that actually is really very interesting because when we got this bill, we got a constituent case. Elena and Sam worked that constituent case. That constituent was okay, but it was a ton of hardship. However, we got the bill and we started to work with Mass Health and we said, what's up? How, how can we do this? We, we're doing more, we're recovering more of the estate. That doesn't allow for any kind of wealth generation and passing it on. It's really destabilizing for people who've just lost a loved one. Why aren't we doing the minimum? Just what the federal government tells us we have to do. We send the money to the federal government anyway. Why take it from our people? So we met with Mass Health and they made some changes. Um, and that's the power of legislation. Sometimes we file legislation and we use it um, to get our state partners to do what we need them to do. However, they didn't go far enough. So the bill is back. We just had another um, meeting with the Mass Health folks, and we're going to keep pushing on this, Norman. Um, so um, there you go. And I really appreciate that. Um, I have a question here from Shalini. Um, uh, could you please, thank you, Shalini, for this question. Could you please share what is being done to, system, to systemically address racial gaps in schools, um, income, and home ownership? What can towns do better advocating for systemic changes for social and racial equity? Thank you. Um, and thank you for your service. Um, so this is a great question. Don't Whoever's doing the questions, I want to read it so I can get to um, Shalini's full question. Um, so there's a number of uh, state investments from ARPA and from the budget um, that are in schools currently. We passed something called the Student Opportunity Act, um, and that is continuing to invest more and more money because before that, and that's, you know, we passed that in 2019, really a kid's, a kid's zip code would uh, determine the quality of that kid's education, right? A, a, a civil and human rights travesty. So we continue to invest more and more and more. At the same time, it, it's not enough yet. At the same time, we're investing more money in special education, something called a circuit breaker, and we're um, investing more money uh, in transportation, although not enough. Um, and we're investing more money in, in special education um, that's writ large. We're investing more money to cover the impact of charter school uh, mitigation funds. Um, and so we're doing that. Now that's not enough. Um, we have to also then do all the wraparound work. That's the kind of social safety network that we know, right? That is from the ground up. We have to start uh, the equity proposition from early childcare and hear Claire Higgins and every other Anat and all the other people in the district make me so smart about this. So we've begun, um, thanks to great advocacy from this district, we'll begin to make some meaningful investments in early childcare. Um, and then I just wanna say um, that we have to also um, increase the diversity and capacity of teacher workforces. And that's, that's also a bill proposition um, that I uh, support, right? So that our, our teacher 
workforce and our staff workforce looks like the kids that we're engaging with. Many educators are part of this, so I'm not telling any of you anything new, um, but these are really good questions. And in terms of affordable housing and making communities affordable, um, you know, that is the work of this region. That is, that's why you saw me do almost all of the million dollars that I spent in ARPA and my own earmarks investing locally, but that is a piece of work, again, that so many in this community are advocating for. Um, I really, really appreciate that question. Um, uh, let's see, I'm going down now. Nancy from Nancy. Um, uh, let's see, oh, Nancy's question just left me, okay. Uh, Nancy, I love this question. I, I understand that getting past all the special interests and passing Medicare for all will be difficult, but our current insurance landscape just gets worse and worse. Um, so thank you for that. Um, thank you uh, for asking about Net Medicare for all. As folks know, I support that bill. Um, I believe in a single payer system. Um, I will say that uh, the PACT Act in the Senate, that's the cost control, that's an insurance cost control bill, I didn't talk enough about it, um, is really lowering the cost of medication and the Mental Health ABC Act similarly lowers the um, cost. It doesn't do, though go to a single payer system. And that's a, that's a critical difference and I wanna own that. So I'm not, I'm not um, sugarcoating this for you, Nancy. Um, I do think that we have to move in a more sure-footed way um, to that kind of healthcare transformation um, that is so critically needed. Um, and you know, I'm just gonna have to stay in it with you um, all the way. But I, the Senate is trying to make some changes. Again, not the kind of sweeping change you're talking about. Um, let's see. Oh, Kathy um, from Orange, uh, microtransit. What is microtransit? Um, I want you to... Um, I want to thank you, and I'm sorry if I use jargon. Um, here's, here's how I think about microtransit. Um, in Western Massachusetts, right, we love our RTAs. There aren't enough stops or enough routes. That's just true. Um, so what we have to do is figure out the right, um, the right equation. And I think, and the Franklin Regional Council of Governments thinks, and the FRTA is looking at this so well, um, that if we do things like smaller vehicles on demand or uh, public private ride shares or some state subsidy um, for getting folks to work in a new job or to healthcare or to school. These are all things that could make a reasonable and real difference in Franklin County. So that's why I invested in the, um, in the Franklin Regional Council of Governments. They're doing this really awesome ride, ride share um, micro pilot. Um, it was you know delayed because of COVID, but I'm pretty excited about it. And they're doing it in partnership with a ton of social service agencies. Um, and it might be a really interesting spark for the private economy of Lyft and Uber, but these are sort of think of them like public lifts. Um, so we're gonna have to see. Uh, what we know is we can't run those big buses out to where very few people are. We're never gonna be able to do that financially. It's not so good for the environment. Um, and we just don't have the population yet to support it. Um, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we're gonna, we're seeing, we're learning. And so is the FRTA um, and they're doing a great, um, great, great piece of work, the FRTA, um, as is the PVTA. Um, uh, Mary asks, is there anything in the pipeline to assist um, homeowners to transition from heating oil furnaces to green heating and cooling? Um, thank you, Mary. Look, uh, here's the thing. Um, we have set, the, the climate bill that we passed and that was signed into law at the beginning of this session sets a net zero commonwealth by 2050. The building sector and the transportation sector are the two biggest emitters. And we have to get real in terms of the costs it's going to take to bring homes and businesses and schools um, and you know hospitals and university campuses like UMass wants to do to bring them to net zero. And so there is a tiny bit of money um, relative to the enormity of need uh, in the Senate. The Senate's pushed through through ARPA um, and through this budget, but 
you know, really amazing folks like Jim McGovern and Elizabeth Warren and, and um, Senator Warren, Senator Markey and Congressman McGovern are really very, very mindful of the kind of massive federal investment we need. Um, and there has to be better programs. There are, and if you're interested, please do um, email us. There are um, some grant programs, um, but again, they're very complicated and I'm happy to talk to you about them as a constituent matter. Um, let's see, um, Jeff is talking about the really important um, legislation, which I love to co-sponsor, um, the modernizing participation in public meetings. Um, we must keep the option for remote participation here at home and in the state house. How glorious is it when I open up a meeting, you know, that I'm chairing and there's all these Western Mass faces where if I'm there to testify and there is my neighbors. Um, we cannot, coming out of COVID, if there's one thing that we get, from this terrible time, it's that we should use technology to crack open democracy. That's it. Um, so I love this. I've made it clear to Senate colleagues that I love it, Senate leadership. We've extended these provisions in the state house and for municipalities, and we have to do more. Um, we have to make this option permanent. And I've also heard from municipalities um, that they really love it, that they, like the state house, are getting more people in their meetings. So let's do it. Let's lean in, it's working. Um, uh, let's see, ah, um, there's, a, there's a, thank you, Matt, for this question. Um, this is a question from Matt and Matt is saying, can you end the punitive practice of charging significantly above market rates for inmate phone calls at Western Massachusetts Women's Correctional Centers and other jails and prisons in the Commonwealth? Go Matt, yes. This has been a bill that has been beautifully championed by people like Senator Sonia Chang-Diaz. Um, and I have to tell you some good news, which is the House um, put this in their budget. Um, so um, that was a huge cheer, great on our House members. Um, and we're gonna have to just get that through conference. I have a lot of confidence that we will. Um, so that is really, really, really good. Um, uh, Diane asks, um, how do we know that the money for UMass is going to reduce tuition and fees and costs rather than um, add to salaries um, of administrators? And uh, Diane, this is a really good question. Certainly we talk about this to Senate um, leadership, certainly to the good folks at UMass. Um, you know, I believe uh, professors have to get well paid, you know, good paid. I believe that we should not have as many adjuncts, right? That we should have our professors have benefits. Um, a lot of this money is directed directly to students um, because it is an understanding. Again, this is shared in the public higher ed sector. Um, so not just by me and um, is that we have to um, keep tuition down. Coming out of COVID, one of the things that was brutally true is that students of color and students from low income backgrounds disproportionately did not attend college for the first time and they disproportionately dropped out, right? What does that tell you? It tells you that the pandemic was harder in these communities. Um, and the, one of the ways into the recovery for the Commonwealth and for our people is this gorgeous, beautiful ladder of public higher education. So we have to keep it affordable. Um, again, I, uh, it was one of my top asks in the Senate and programs like Mass Grant, which is this big old um, financial aid program was well-funded um, in the Senate budget. And we just have to keep pushing for a reinvestment. I'll say here that um, I have a bill called the Cherish Act um, and it would reinvest more than we've done for public higher education, $500 million more. Why? Not because I just want to go around spending money. It's because over, although I don't mind investing, right, in public infrastructure, um, but in the last 10 years in Massachusetts, and numbers don't lie, we have disinvested in public higher education by 31% per student. That means in 10 years, 31% per student, we've had a cut 
oh, that cut doesn't look like, oh, we're going to cut you public higher education. It looks like, oh, we're not going to fund it so much in this grant program or for this capital improvement. And slowly, 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 and with inflation, our public investment in our beautiful public institutions goes down. And who bears the cost of that? Students and faculty. So thank you, Diane. I'm with you. Um, I am looking at Cheryl. Um, how do I see the voting record on bills? Um, so Cheryl, um, really good question. Um, there, this is a, a thorny one on rules. Um, so the Senate and the House have some different rules, just different bodies, different rules. I'll only talk about myself here. Um, I tell the constituents on my website, um, all of the votes um, that I make um, on the floor, I publish. And I also, um, you can ask me any committee vote you want, um, any, any kind of vote. I, my policy and my team's policy is that I work for you and therefore every vote I take is your business. Um, so there you go. Um, how, oh, Bruce asks a good question. How do you divide up constituency services between your office and the reps? This is an art and not a science, um, Bruce. Our reps are fabulous, right? And so um, Rachel um, or Elena or Cameron, um, you know, they'll get on the phone when we get a call from someone or an email or, a, you know, a web form and we'll say, you know, hey, do you, are you working with this person? Um, we would like to pick up this case. If it's an email, we might flip it around and say, hey, we got this. Or some are one of our rep partners will flip it around and say, hey, I got this. And we'll say, okay, we'll pile on. So it's incredibly collegial. Um, and, you know, we're stronger out here when we're together. Um, so we have to work as a team, right? Because, um, you know, what's that? There's lots of people say this all the time, but like the number of reps and senators in the four Western counties, you know, is basically like a big ring around Boston. Um, so we have to be smarter. And we, I think, are smarter um, because we just love each other and we work really well together um, for our people. Um, Phoebe, I mentioned you earlier, Phoebe. Um, is there hope for legislation that will protect people from the cliff effect? Yes. Um, we just had a colleague lose her qualification for public housing after she worked uh, extra hours as a recovery coach and quote, made too much. Um, the cliff effect is one of the most insidious uh, pieces of government. There are many, as you know, Phoebe, many cliff effect bills. I have one about the continuity of care and being able to have elders and people living with disabilities remain in their homes. Right now, if you make a dollar more um, than the state says you can and should, you have, you have to either spend everything you have down up until $542 a month, which is nuts, or you have to go into a nursing home to get the care you need and deserve. That's wrong. Um, I'm fighting like hell for this bill, um, but there are other bills. And yes, this is just government being punitive and small. Um, and you're going to call us to do better, Phoebe, and we will. Um, and I, you know, there are great people in the Senate, and you know them, Julian Sear and Cindy Friedman, um, you know, that are have been working on this, and I'm I'm happy to join them. Um, uh, let's see, I'm I'm scrolling through friends, I'm staying with this. Um, Tom. Tom says, um, thanks to you and Brian for your great work on the bill to allow state retirees um, to adjunct teach, substitute teach and serve as school bus drivers beyond um, the current limits on hours. This is all really important. Given that this is time sensitive, do you think the Senate will act on it in the near future? Um, it is my hope um, that uh, we will be able to make gains on this bill. Um, I am I'm not confident uh, that we are going to be able to get it across the finish line. Um, and this does not make me happy saying this to you, Tom. Um, and so, um, and we can talk more about this, uh, but it is, it wasn't an issue that my colleagues saw as clearly as Brian and I did and Jared did. Um, so we're going to have to keep at it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, there's an anonymous attendee 
um, who says, what are the chances that First Light projects won't get renewed? Um, so First Light is exceedingly complicated. Um, and I really, I urge everyone here who is interested in talking about First Light. Um, Elena, would you put your email in the chat um, so that everybody could um, be in touch with you? Elena has been leading work, not only for our office, but I have to say she's rocking it um, for the region. Um, uh, what I think we can do is make a meaningful, meaningful impact on this relicensing. It's a generational opportunity. Um, we, uh, along with, uh, we're deeply partnering with the Franklin County delegation here. We're talking to the state regularly. Um, we're talking to First Light. Um, we're talking to the advocates in the municipalities. Um, I, the relicensing uh, will happen. How it happens and what happens as a result of that um, is on us right now. And I, I'll tell you, I feel the weight of it intensely. Um, intensely. Um, Sherry Morgan um, asks, hello Sherry, uh, how can we help you advocate for better funding um, for municipal infrastructure? Um, this was a report by the auditor, Auditor Bump. She is like a rock star, Auditor Bump. She is a rural person's dream come true. Um, so she had this beautiful, beautiful piece of work that looked at both not only regional schools, which was something she did before, but she looked at municipal infrastructure and she said, hello, wake up Massachusetts. Out here, they've got a ton more space and not a lot of cap, we don't have a tax base to do what needs to be done for first responders, for municipal buildings, for roads, for bridges. So a couple things here, Sherry. One is um, Natalie Blay and I have a municipal building infrastructure uh, bill that I love that's um, gaining some ground. We're working with the auditor. We've met with the treasurer um, and we are pushing to get this bill out of committee along with some other colleagues who have similar bills. And that would help a community like Bernardston that needs a new fire station because their fire truck can't fit in the fire station. Um, and, and Bernardston doesn't have the population that it needs, right? It's, sorry, I'm getting angry. It's I'm angry that the state can't understand the differential in scale out here. Um, so we're working on that. Um, we're also fighting for things like the winter road money that came out that finally looked at uh, money for roads and road repair in the way we should look at it, which is the amount of our roads, not in the chapter 90 formula, which is misguided for our Western Mass community. So I think you can help us advocate um, by you know, being in touch with us, by testifying, by writing to Senate leadership, this is just on the Senate side, um, and by joining forces with other people and municipalities um, who are doing this. Um, I'm scrolling, scrolling. Um, I'm looking, I'm trying to figure out what questions we haven't asked yet, um, answered yet, sorry. Um, Uh, Chad is asking, I'm sorry, I missed you, Chad, in the scroll. Um, how can we develop policy that supports rooftop solar? Um, until, um, un ah, before solar farms are developed, to have them um, municipally or privately owned rather than large corporations. So Chad, um, you're singing my song about solar on the built environment. I'm totally with you. Um, I have to say that uh, solar on the built environment is such a critical public good. Um, and I do feel that we in Western Massachusetts that are stewarding the open land for the Commonwealth feel the tug here more acutely. Um, I will tell you, Chad, that we are sometimes called NIMBYs out in Western Massachusetts. And this makes me hop and mad. Um, and we're called NIMBYs because we're trying to say, hey gang, let's build it over highways. Let's build it over garages, over parking lots. Let's build it on roofs. Um, let's not take down that tree um, if we can, right? Let's exhaust the built environment first. And let's do that with public will and public money um, in supporting it. Um, I'm not saying that we should never put solar in a field. I'm not saying that we shouldn't put solar over, for example, 
for example, capped landfills. I'm actually also not saying that there's not an equation out there where um, we wouldn't take down trees for solar. That's not what I'm saying. Um, but I am saying that we have to have the state understand um, the cost benefit analysis of how much carbon sequestration we need and food production and the solar energy we need. We can and should do this. The Smarter Smart Program amendment that we passed in the climate bill really jumpstarts this as it asks really to look at the impact of, of solar proliferation. Now, when people say in Western Mass, like oh, in Boston, oh, you Western Mass people, you're, um, you hate solar, you're NIMBYs. I say, you know what? No, you're wrong. We love solar in Western Massachusetts. We want to put a bow around it. We want to direct people off the highway to see our solar installations. We want it to be equitable, meaning we want people to have equal access to it. And that's what the, um, the single parcel rule that I had did. Um, that means co-housing and multiple units in a building. Everybody can benefit from net metering costs, not just the people who had the ability to put solar panels on their roofs to begin with. The one unit, all the units have to be able to benefit from it and get some money back and send some energy to the grid. So we want equity and we want the state to have a theory about if we're gonna to get to net zero or actually, frankly, far beyond net zero, what's the equation we need for carbon sequestration? What's the equation we need for wind? What's the equation we need for solar and some of the other pockets of energy? Um, and so, yes, we have to privilege solar on the built environment. This is not rocket science. Um, and it is, it is being done and planned um, and forwarded, but not in the kind of uh, way that I think it, we should. Um, I am coming up on this 615 hour, um, friends, and uh, I promised that we would get you out of here. Um, uh, I'm gonna take the last question um, from Doug Tanner. Um, Doug asks, Doug Tanner makes me honest um, all the time. He asks about the status of chances of special education funding study. Um, we are well aware that you've worked hard on this in the past. God bless you, Doug. Um, I, one of the, you know, so when you get in, you do all kinds of work, right? You figure out your lane. Where can I be helpful? Where's like, where are the gifts of my team? I happen to have Jared Friedman, who's like a total energy nerd, right? So we can throw down on energy. Um, I happen to just fall in love with the idea of sequestration in our farms and our forests and clean water and PFAS, you know? So that's like, I, I've taken some of that on, of course, public health. Um, and I've also taken on special education. And, you know, Doug, you know this. Um, and just today, I was on the phone um, with the great folks who were doing the um, Rural Schools Commission. There will be, I'm happy to tell you this, Doug, um, a recommendation in the Rural Schools Commission report that's coming out. And here, let me tip my hat to Rep. Blay and Senator Hines um, for their leadership that's going to talk about uh, special education. So friends, here's the deal. Um, in this foundation budget review, uh, we, and, and the great work that Senator Cheng Diaz did, it was just gorgeous, right? And others. Um, it looked at the differential impacts if you come from a low income district, if you're an English language learner, um, numbers of other things, right? And said, ah, oh, geez, that's gotta cost a little bit more. But we did this thing with special education that is so backward, which is we set this assumed percentage threshold. Um, and now we've eked it up a little bit, right? 17%, um, but not much. And then we said, okay, so roughly it's gonna be in that range of kids who are special education students or have IEPs. And then roughly a kid is gonna need special education services for a quarter uh, of a day. Well, I don't know where they go to school. And I don't know, I, I don't know what people are thinking. Um, that's not what's happening across the Commonwealth. And I've taken this on. Um, we need to look at how we fund special education, the transportation piece of it, the circuit breaker, which is this extraordinary need. And we have to look at the way in which our communities are funding special education above that assumed threshold. And there are many, in fact, 
all but one of our districts in Western Massachusetts, this Senate district, have special education thresholds above uh, special education numbers, i.e. the numbers of kids on special education um, portfolios above what the state assumes we do. And that means that municipality funds that. Now, not one of our schools begrudges the fund and not one of our towns begrudges the education of our children, but the state has to get real about the cost of special education. It has to. Um, and so I filed a bill with Dan Carey um, that you know about, Doug, um, that lots of people here have been advocating for. Um, man, it didn't make it again. Um, and uh, but it will go into the uh, the it will go into the um, rural schools because the rural schools commission identified this gap in special education as a critical perilous reality for our small towns because you don't have the scale to be able to rise and pay for special education services the way a bigger wealthier town does and ps that bigger wealthier town um, they don't have a lot of the intersecting realities um, like you know some of the poverty that we see in western massachusetts and they don't have some of that and so their special education numbers are lower than the threshold so guess what they win um, and we're not winning, but we will win on this issue, I promise you. Um, this is an issue I'm gonna keep fighting for as long as you send me back to Boston. Every single day, I think about this when I'm, when I'm doing this work, because it's one of those core main issues that I have to get right. And plus my wife, Anne, is a special education teacher. Um, and so she brings it home uh, along with economics and she brings it home to me every day about how we're missing the mark for the kids that we need to thrive and grow healthy and strong. And so with that, my friends, it is 6.19. I've kept you four more minutes than I promised. So many of you are still here. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity to serve you. There's many questions I didn't get to answer and I'm very sorry. Um, I'm sure we're gonna, we're gonna follow up with a recording of this evening. Um, we're gonna follow up with our email. You can, of course, email, call us, I'll meet you. You can come and visit us in the district office or in Boston. Um, the team is, you know, churning away, chugging away. Um, thank you for spending this time with us. Thank you for putting your faith in us as a team. It is an honor for all of us to work on your behalf. You are the smartest, best constituents. I'm not saying this just because I'm your senator. It's I, I'm trying to think of being objective here, but of course I'm not. Um, I love you all. I'm grateful to serve you. And we'll end this webinar now. Thanks, Sam, for running it. Take care, everybody, and good night.